Is everybody ready? Do we have our books? Are we comfortable? Do we have our beverage of choice? Our snack? Welcome back to Sci-Fi and Fantasy Read Along. I am ATN. And I am Yule. And DM Phil. Got it right this time, huh? Wow. Before we get started, I'd like to say thank you to one of our fans and regular commenters, Tyler L., who went out of his way to track us down to find a way to support our podcast because we don't have Patreon and we're not planning on getting it anytime soon. So Tyler packed up a box of books and sent them to me so that I could sell them on my bookstore online. So thank you, Tyler, very much for the donation and for your support. And we hope that you enjoy this episode. In our last episode, we finally met Andamander Rake as he dropped in on High Alchemist Baruch, and a dazzling plan for vengeance took shape in an unlikely mind. So we are going to be discussing Chapter 7 today. Yeah. It was a shortish chapter, so it shouldn't be a... Do you guys have any problems with the chapter? Did you encounter anything that took you out of the book? Did you encounter anything that made you bothered you in any way or not really but it's like you said we're going to start off with like a dream interpretation i have a hard problem with those because it's subject to interpretation and it's kind of subjective yeah it's intended to be somewhat opaque i think before we actually start the chapter we've got that little epitaph in the very beginning which is unclear until you read the first couple pages exactly so there's a man crouching on a funeral pyre like inside a burning funeral pyre and it's a gedrobi epitaph the Gedrobi Hills are just east of Darujistan, and Gedrobi District is one of the poorer districts in Darujistan. So anyway. Leaving Darujistan by the South Road, Krupp dreams of a difficult path. So Krupp leaves town via a different gate than the last time. And he's heading due south. Like if you look on the map, he goes out. Cutter Lake Road is the, is the road that's taking him out of town into the fields that surround the city. I thought he said Monkey Road. No, no, no. What's, what's a Monkey Road? It's where the uh, thieves travel up above. The Monkey Road is what Crocus was on when he was being followed and attacked by the Tisti Andy. Yeah, you're right. It's in this dream when Krupp first uh, is thinking about the coin. And he uh, is an envisioning crocus with it. And that's why he's talking about Monkey Road. I have, to, I have to remind you that Krupp has dreamt about the coin before. Mm-hmm. In his first dream, he knew that the coin was going to a youth. He didn't know who the youth was. I don't know that he knows who the youth is now. Well, maybe he did know. He might. He might. But I don't know if it's clear. Why do, you think, why do you think it was going to Crocus, other than you know that it's already in Crocus's hands? Why do you- <laughs> um, I don't know, because we've read this chapter. And maybe it's just the knowledge of this chapter that makes me say that, and I shouldn't have said it. Okay, so tell me about, why does he call it a monkey road? And well, hold on, first, let's set, this, let's set the scene. He's leaving town in his dream, and he says everything's in flux, and he's talking about the road, and he calls it a monkey road. Why would he call it a monkey road? I don't know. I think because ultimately it's, it's, it's Hatter's. And he asked is a question in what it, he said precisely. The coin has entered a child's possession, though he knows it not. Is it for Krupp to walk this monkey road? I think he's talking about the, the vision and the portents or the g- game of gods. I don't know. You're talking about his first dream. No, no, not I'm talking about right this now. one right here. Okay. Because he's asking a question of himself as in, is it for me to play this game? Is it for me to walk this monkey road? I, the monkey road is a euphemism for the game of the gods, I think. I, okay, so the trick that I use is I will, I will take what he tells me about it, and then I will say it out loud. And what I, what I concluded was he is walking on a difficult path. Yes. He says that there are a lot of rocks, the road is really rutted, and it's a difficult path. Monkey Road would be very difficult for Krupp to use. He's out uh, of shape. He's uh, round. What's up, Yule? Except for the fact that we know that he has perfect symmetry. Yes. Never has to practice at anything. Nevertheless, I think what he's getting at is that it's a difficult path that he is walking. So what does he do? He leaves the road for a reason. No, I think the Monkey Road, he's referring to the game of the gods. To me, it's just a straight analogy. What he's doing, his walk right now in his dream, 
is exactly what you say. It's the path that he's walking in life right now. Well, that, yes, it's an analogy to the light, to, to the path that he's walking. Uh, I think we're actually in agreement. It starts off with him saying, "All is in flux," and then he says. The coin has entered a child's possession, though he knows it not. Is it for me to walk this monkey road? Because right now, that's what Crocus is doing. He doesn't know that. I think he does know it. Why? What makes you say that? You guys are reading into the book. No, he's He's literally saying it. He is not literally saying it. He would say it literally, Crocus has the coin, if he was literally saying it. Well, he's saying Crocus has the coin. He said a child. He said, okay, fine. He said a child, and he says, is it for me to walk the monkey road? As in, I don't have the coin. I don't want the coin, right? Because he knows he's being in the pawn of a god. He's saying, I don't, want to, I don't want to play that part in the game. Well, nevertheless, uh, I think we're going to have to disagree about this one, but he does leave the road. And it's, he's cold, and he sees a fire off in the distance, and a figure. Who's at the fire? Uh, a gentleman named Kroll. Well, how did Kroll get there? He doesn't know either. He kind of knows. Well, it wasn't Krupp that did it. Krupp is aware of the fact that he did not summon Kroll. And Kroll was not sure who did, but somebody seems to have. Kroll is an elder god, supposedly a dead god that nobody worships anymore. But they still have his tower and his temple and his belfry in town for some reason. Where did the first victim of the assassin war, where did he die? Exactly. Kroll's belfry. Yeah. Did it imply that Kroll was kind of summoned because that was sort of like a blood sacrifice or his death summoned him or the blood? Or... I think he said it wasn't enough, but yet here he is. Well, I don't get it. He's got his hands in the fire and it's not burning them. And I don't, I don't comprehend the significance of that. But Krupp doesn't feel the flame from, or the heat from the flame either. He doesn't stick his hands in it though. Well, that's true. He does say it doesn't feel very warm, but he is closer to life than this guy ever was, at least recently. So when Kroll says that he thinks he's here to because he's summoned to wit to what witness someone being awakened, is is this all in Krupp's dream? He's talking about it, or something more? Well, I don't know, Yule. He's definitely in the dream. But, I mean, how, how real are Krupp's dreams? I would argue that they're very real. I think they are. So Krupp can know when an elder god is in front of him. He did recognize Kroll. And he guessed, though. It, wasn't, it was an educated guess. I don't know why. It doesn't specify how he made the guess. But he had an inclination that it was Kroll, and, and he was correct. So what is this elder god here for? Someone summoned him. To witness a birth, a rebirth. Someone who has been asleep or away for a long time is coming back. No idea what that means. I don't think that we're supposed to at this point. And he also delivers a portent or prophecy. Yeah. And then he walks away. What's the prophecy? He gives that right as he's leaving. He gets bored with Krupp and he, he starts to head off to the northeast, which... What's to the northeast? Is it the Gadrubi Hills? What? The, the hills are that way and so is his temple. Then there's the whole ancient fire bit that he tells Krep to give you warmth in times of need. And then seek the Talana Moss, who will lead the woman. Very mysterious. Yeah. Who's the woman? They are the Awakeners. And who are the Awakeners? So as Kroll's leaving Krupp, he says to him, play on, mortal. Every god falls at a mortal's hands. Such is the only end to immortality. So Krupp thinks that that is ammunition. He thinks that's leverage of some kind and that he's, he's willing to use that. He's also mortal. He is. And Krupp acknowledged that he was a player. Right in the very beginning, even, when he's deciding whether or not like, he wants to walk this monkey road. He had taken on the mantle in the first dream. He had acknowledged that he needed to take responsibility in this case and stand up and defend Darujistan and the people that he knew and loved. And he didn't want to move on. He liked it there. And, and he took on the mantle. So here he is, having taken up the mantle, and now he's walking a hard road. And it leads him straight to this guy, Krull, who is an elder god, as we've discussed, who gives him valuable information, which he stores away in that beautiful mind of his. Circle Breaker struggles to stay the course. 
we get a we get a nice little bit of circle breaker off duty circle breaker right a tormented circle breaker it seems you think he's tormented or conflicted conflicted at least yeah he is thinking about his past and how it relates to him today and all the things that he's done and it's leading him to this moment this section takes place after his shift is ended. Yeah. He has walked down to the stone pier at the water's edge, essentially, to meet his contact, the eel's agent. He's ruminating over his past. I'm not sure why, but the, you do find out a little bit about his past, so he's not so nebulous. Not his name, but he, he was born and raised in this city. Is that right? But yeah, I, I think it's to show that he has the city's best interest at heart. Even though, and it's it's mentioned here, he would be branded a traitor to Darujistan, he has the belief that he's doing right by Darujistan. Okay, we kind of touched on this a little bit last time. I think that more accurately what he's done is he's put himself in opposition to somebody who he views as an enemy of freedom and Darujistan. Remember, he was an enemy of tyranny. That was the whole point about the despots Barbican and etc. It was to set this moment up so that we don't view him as a traitor, even though what he's doing is considered treasonous. Right. He sure. he came out and said he he would never let another tyrant up on in charge. Not not if he if it was in his power, he would do everything he could to stop it. So here he is. He has set himself opposite Turban Or is what he's done, and he's scared. Yeah, he's scared. And the tyrant is Malazan? The tyrant is the abuse of power. Okay. It's just anybody's abuse of power. When you have a plutocracy where just the rich benefit. Later on in this chapter, because we're probably not going to discuss it. I'm just going to mention it now. But do you remember at the very end of the chapter when Crocus is commenting on how long it's been since a nobleman has been hung in the yeah. city? Oh, and yeah. that every single week they have to replace the ropes in the lower quarters. Because the ropes are stretched out from all the hangings. <laughs> well, that's a form of tyranny. Sure. Where the rich are not subject to the law. Mm -hmm. That is what Circle Breaker is opposing. He wants to make sure that that kind of thing does not get out of hand. And I think he thinks if Turban Orr is in control, then yeah, it's going to get out of hand. But he doesn't know. He doesn't know what the eel is into. He doesn't know what the eel's goals are. Even his contact doesn't know. So he's queried, and he's just trusting that the eel's a good guy. Too much trust for me. Well, he doesn't really talk about how he was recruited or why. But he does talk about being recruited. We got into an argument about that. Who did? We did. Oh, I don't remember what the result was. The, the result was you thought you were right, and I thought I was right. Okay. <laughs> well, then, then the answer is I'm right. The answer is that... He did not seek out the eel. The eel's agent sought him out. Ever since he was approached by the eel's agent, his, you know, his life has taken a different turn or whatever. That's, that's the way it was put here. So he was recruited. He was recruited. He did not seek it out. So there's a deadlock in the Senate. And this is why Circle Breaker is scared now. Because that deadlock, Turban Orr assumes that the deadlock was caused by a spy. And so he's been sending his, his agents out to find out who snitched. Circle Breaker knows that it's only a matter of time that this man figures out that there are no spies in his network, so it's somebody else. And then, then his anonymity is gone, and he's, he's in mortal danger. Never reach too far. That's kind of the theme of this little section. Yes. Yeah, it, it's reminiscent with the, uh, for me, when Whiskey Jack was telling Yes. You know, stay, stay low out of the radar of the gods you know? <laughs> yes, yes. In, in, a, in a very smaller setting uh, like Darujistan. It's the same thing for this guy. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think so. Do you think there was any point to them talking about the, um, the privateers other than that was an ex example of reaching too far to like make it clear to us what it means? Because like they felt, they felt a hubris in his estimation so I don't really see those things as related. So why is he talking about them? I think you will kind of just said, I think the point of it is to bring forth that message of never reach too far. And that was the, that was the story that kind of proved that point. I, I'm not sure. So if they I, just, they just reached too far by being greedy. I think so. And so how did, how did Circle Breaker reach too far? Because he, he's afraid now. He, he thinks he's reached too far. Well, essentially he ratted out the, this is nothing new, though. He's been doing this for a year. Yes, but he seriously impacted, you know, the path of the city moving forward. Plus, somebody has died also, you know. 
all three of us know that that had nothing to do with him. Well, yeah, those, but it, oh. doesn't, it doesn't make him any less scared about what's going on. No, right? he doesn't know that he didn't have anything to do with that, but we right. know he didn't have anything to do with exactly. that. So, so it's something else. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying he doesn't realize that, he, that the cause of the assassination was, was a pawn. He thinks he delivered the note to the Eels agent, it went up the chain, and they killed somebody for it. That's what he thinks. Yeah, that's what I thought he thought. But that's not what actually happened. No. Nevertheless, he thinks he's reached too far. And he needs help. So how is he going to get it? Well, he wrote this scroll, wrote on the scroll, and he's going to give it to the agent that he's going to meet up with. And he's going to let the eel know that he can't handle turban ore on his own. So does he? He rips up the scroll. He doesn't want it to go up anymore. He doesn't want it to get to the eel. He's not going to request assistance. I think he's going to fall on the sword is basically what I think is going on there. I think you're right. I've gone this far. I care about the city this much. I, I, I want, like you said, tyranny to end or at least, you know, get a punch in the eye. Yeah. <laughs> And if it has to, ha if I have to suffer as a result of it, I, I will. And the thing is, is as this chapter ends, he goes back home, and you see how he lives, and it's a, and it's a very nondescript, gray. Nobody is going to notice who I am as a person. Life that he lives outside of doing what he's doing. Yeah, his room is completely bare. I think that was the only choice he could, you know, do that whole fall on the sword bit. Because, you know, that's what his life has led to. I think you're right, but I'd like to elaborate just a little bit. So what would happen if he asked the eel for help and the eel decided to help him? He would have to be whisked away or something, right? He can't just stay there. If he thinks he's compromised and he asks for help and help arrives, then a valuable asset to the eel is taken off of the board, right? He can no longer be used to do his job. So his purpose would be sacrificed for the sake of his safety. And I think he, like Krupp, has decided that the city is worth everything. It's worth dying for. It's worth taking the risk. So he's taking on that responsibility for himself as well. And he's going to stay in position as long as he possibly can in order to do as much damage to the enemy as he possibly can. I think that sounds good. You have no disagreement with that? None whatsoever. I, I'm ethically obligated to disagree with you if I do, you know. Uh huh. But no, I, I didn't really fully comprehend what was going on there, but that makes sense to me. Okay. So we talked about his anonymity. It was mentioned in the description that his room was entirely bare so that a wizard couldn't lock on to him. No counter spies or whatever would be able to learn anything from him. And there's one other thing that we learn when he's walking back to his house before he gets there and we get that nice description. He's walking through the market and that's where all the silks are. And he's talking about how rare some of those silks are becoming. They're not available anymore. So like this is the last batch of some of those bolts because up in the north, the Malazans have cut off all trade. And in the south, something else is going on. Two cities were annexed by the Panian Seer. That's all it mentions. It doesn't give any other details. Yeah, and if you look at the map in the beginning of the book, you'll see that uh, the Panion Seer has carved out a wedge on the southern part of this continent. And this happened in the last month. Those two cities fell. One more important point here. After he tears up the scroll and he chunks all the pieces into the ocean and they float away, he says he hears, faintly hears a spinning coin sound, but it said it sounds sad. When we had a pre-discussion, I said, I don't, I don't comprehend what that meant. Do you now? No, I mean, I get it. Like, Have you given it thought? Opon was, Opon was watching, or that was some pivotal moment, and maybe Opon was disappointed on the direction it went. I don't know. What do you think is going to happen to this guy now? He has taken on this responsibility. He has determined that he's going to stay in place, even though he's afraid for his life. And when he makes that decision, when he's chosen that path, he hears the sound of the spinning coin and it sounds sad to him. What do you think he thinks is going to happen to him? He's dying. He is a dead man walking. So I think the sound being a sad sound, that's kind of what it does to me, right? I take that as Erickson giving me permission to feel that he's doomed, right? Or it's a suggestion from him that this guy is dead. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. It's either that Opon, uh, something that Opon wanted to have happen didn't happen, or it's a narration from Opon in this situation. 
Do you think every time, do you think Upon is like omnipotent? Do you think Upon is aware of absolutely everything that's going on? No, but in matters that affect Opon, probably. Yeah, but how does how does Opon know? The reach is wide right now. Opon is extremely powerful, but I don't think omnipotent. The sort of chance to the coin, you know, the coin flip and everything that in itself is not omnipotence, right? I mean, any you don't know how you're going to go. Well, how when, does Opon know who to pay attention to? Well, they still have desires. Well, so do I. So does a butterfly. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Opon's got a long time to a, lives a lot longer than a butterfly, I would assume. So Opon would be considered a child god. Do you do you think so? I mean, that Kroll Kroll in the beginning and and Krupp's dream said the child gods have underestimated him and that he's going to lose that battle, but he's not going to die. And he says the child gods, you know, are, are responsible. That might be. For this. I, I thought of them as younger. I mean, since they're like brother and sister, you always kind of think of brother and sister earlier in life than later. That's true. That's true. But I mean, we don't really know anything about Opon other than their a realm of influence, right? Right. But we don't know how old they are. We don't know if they're elder gods. We don't know if they're young gods. We don't know. Lady Simtal entertains another councilman. Simtal, that's what. Okay, so we've got a we've got a lord and a lady, but they're not lord and lady with the same last name, and they're both <laughs> they're both not wearing any clothes. So I think something untoward is going on in this room. Wait, but Lady Simtal was hanging out with that counselor that died, right? She was in the previous chapter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that was Lim. Lim. In fact, they're talking about him a bit. Or they she's are thinking talking about him. about him. This section starts off kind of explaining how expensive the assassination was to Lady Simtal and how her hard earned gold. <laughs> <laughs> so that's her perspective. She envisions that she earned that gold, but we've we've heard from someone else that she stole it. But she thinks she earned it. So. That's earning it. It is. In a way, it definitely is. She worked hard for it and she got it. She put in the time is what I'm saying. <laughs> she won. <laughs> well, she didn't win this last one and she, oh my goodness. She's so mad at Lim's wife. She's t spent two days in mourning and then she's already out dancing and gallivanting around with Marilio and like, ooh. And she says she's greedy and it's like, pot calling the kettle black here sure is Murillo, he he really is he's just a player gigolo whatever seducer of women what do you think his what do you think his like job description is i have no idea gigolo gigolo uh he's definitely a dandy and he's definitely available to all of the young noble ladies that aren't married She's she's already upset at Murillo and she gives him credit because she's he has a way with women, but apparently he like two days of her morning, she's already he's already hanging out with Lim's wife. Widow. Widow, yes, correct. Widow. She's available. As far as the rules go, she's available. She knows it too. Yeah, and apparently Lady Simtal is like greedy and jealous. All it's the while she has a guy in her bed. <laughs> Another one. Yeah, Turbinor. This is the guy that thought he had all the votes he needed tidy. Yeah, he was bragging to old Baruch. We're going to get this vote without your assistance very much. Thank you, no, sir. Yeah, so Turbinor is in her bed. Naked. Naked. They, they probably just did something. What have they been doing? You know, I'm not probably just. Why do adults take off their clothes? It's probably hot and they just don't want to overheat. Yes, somebody does say it's warm. Or maybe right. it was just a massage. I don't know. Hmm. But either way, he knows that Councilman Lim got killed here. He knows that. You know, her and ladies, or him and Lady, Lady Simthal were getting jiggy with it. And he doesn't care. He's just here for his own self-satisfaction also. Lady Simthal is also getting information from him. She's trying. She's trying. He's, he's giving her some, but it's all really kind of, you know, not important. Well, what they, is important? The, so Turban Orr thinks that the Darujistan Malazan pact is going to go through anyway. And Lady Simtal is questioning it at every spot she can. You know, one of the things she's like, oh, well, they took out the people in pale. And he's all, well, that's because of the Maranth and they have this 
pact or treaty to get them to do it, they were going to take out the pale people. And then Turban Order is like, it would be good if we take out some of these people. They aren't, they aren't really that important anyway. So, you know, she's trying to get information from him. But ultimately, what Simtol really wants is someone dead. She does. Let's not go there immediately. Let's finish this first half of their encounter. Well, they did talk about Turban Orr, and they mentioned his his well-scarred forearm. And they don't say it, but I'm pretty sure that implies those are dueling scars. Yeah, it's obvious. With all of the other evidence, it's obvious. What other evidence? Uh, we'll get there at the end. How's that? There's a couple of things I want to save to the end, and that's one of them, because it doesn't really actually have any bearing on the chapter or its importance. Well, she also talks about Moonspawn and how it's just sitting there. Yes, and she's like, did you guys think maybe that the Lord of Moonspawn is dead? And I'm like, yeah, we thought about that. And that's as far as it goes. <laughs> it is and it isn't. They've got, a, they've got a tent set up with a messenger down there waiting to deliver a message. They want to make a deal with the Lord of Moonspawn. Right. Little do they know that he's already made a deal with the true rulers of Daruzhistan. So that should wound his pride. Okay, so if you were to describe Lady Simtal in a single word, no, let's, let's describe her mindset. How would you describe her mindset with a single word, Philip? Ambitious. Okay, Yule? Oh, I know, trifling. <laughs> trifling. <laughs> Well, she would be a pain, I guess. That's for sure. <laughs> Notice that she's already considering cultivating Marilio. And she's doing this while she's having this conversation. So she's like, she's in the middle of plotting her next moves right now while she's having this conversation with Turban Orr, who gets tired and wants to get up and go and whip some chains and stuff back up at Majesty Hill. Counts Majesty Hill. Thank you. And he belittles her at every moment. He says that she has the single mindedness, mindedness of like a child. Well, malicious child. He, a malicious child that she couldn't understand what was going on, even though she has obviously questions that he responds to. And she has a way about her that gets those answers from him, even when he wasn't going to give them at all. Turban War and Councilman Lim just kind of chided her and looked down on her for as kind of being like politically unsophisticated pl politically unsophisticated and kind of simple-minded in the realms of like higher intrigue and and yet and yet she's here well and yet yes. they're giving her all sorts of information yeah and you know the other thing is like <laughs> i hate to i hate to say it this way but you know you're not giving this lady a chance to be in that situation and of course that's your only expectation of her is that she's this way you mean and, they're not giving her a chance to use the information that she's been given? Yeah, exactly. You know, you weren't going to invite her into any conversations unless she was screwing you, you know? <laughs> and yet she owns an estate. Yeah, exactly. I thought they were just, well, okay, maybe they're just being like arrogant and condescending and she's well, allowing are. them to do that. Well, I think she's allowing it um, unless... I'm going to hope that she's at least understanding that they're being insulting to her and she's using that to her advantage. Otherwise, she's just stupidly <laughs> screwing her way into some information. I think it's the former, not the latter. So you think she's just pretending to be a hot, dumb chick? Yes, I think so. But she's clearly not dumb. There are times where she lets in. How does she feel about Turban Orr? Right in the beginning, she says very, very blatantly how she feels about him. It implied at that point that she was it's barely concealed contempt or just a hint of it. And it's she let it, she let it slip a little bit and that was a mistake, but he didn't pick up on it supposedly, but his contempt for her is overt. Yes. So he openly holds her in contempt. She does not openly hold him in contempt, but she, she feels contempt for him. So she's playing a game with him getting information. Somehow she's, I mean, she's using him as much as he's using her and his dueling and him as a dueler, it's, it's mentioned twice in this chapter, or this section. The scars on the arm and then his sword is mentioned as well. Well, yeah, she even uh, she, uh, uses it. Does she touch his sword? She does. She does. She totally how, does. How phallic. You think? Yeah, I do. Oh, here we go. Simtal stepped to the bedpost, reaching down to touch the silver pommel of Orr's dueling sword. Mm. And then she says... You should kill him and be done with it. Who does she want killed? I know. I do too. And you don't have to tell me his name, but who is the who is the character that is 
I think it's somebody she used to be married to. I think it's the person she stole this estate from. Yeah. Who is described as a continuous drunk. And there's only one person we've met that fits that description. There's only one so far. Although Krupp drinks a lot. But he never gets drunk. It's amazing, right? Marilio asks a married lady to the get her own fate. So we go from one kind of illegitimate couple to another kind of illegitimate couple. Oh, yeah. Marilio. So it's saved to the end for our gratification. But who is he with? He is with the wife of Councilman Turban Orr. So while he's out stepping out on his wife, she's stepping out with a dandy. They're not in a bedroom. They're in public. Yeah. They're having dinner or drinks or something on the balcony of some restaurant. Tea and crumpets, who knows? What is Murillo after with Mrs. Orr, Lady Orr? Tickets. <laughs> to what? Tickets to a big show. It seems that there's going to be a big old party at the Simtal Estate. It's a spring fate. Murillo needs tickets to get in there. Because he's not been invited, but Lady Orr and her husband are. Obviously, Lady Simtal invited them. She can get an extra pair. If they do, then Marilio and she are going to hit the servants' rooms. Well, they're being, they're being all coy and subtle about it. There is a, an, an agreement made. It's almost like a contract being signed, right? She'll get him the tickets in exchange. She wants a couple hours of his time while they're there. And I don't know what's going on with the nobles and leaders here, but they all seem to be screwing each other. I mean, when you're rich, what else do you do? I have no idea, but I want to be rich. You don't work for money. Well, what does he work for? Beans? Well, Marilio is working for, towards a goal. Oh, okay. I see. Yes. Well, this particular time he's working towards a goal. Apparently he's quite a ladies man, but I don't know if he does that because he enjoys it or because he, there are other objectives there than just. Does he work? I mean, I think it's his job. Is being wined and dined by wealthy women being taken care of by ladies. I think that it's a mutual exchange, right? I think what happens is they use him for casual sex and to be taken out on the town so that they can be seen and to be wine and dine. And he, they in exchange wine and dine him and buy him gifts and afford his lifestyle. But their end goal is to meet a nobleman who they can then marry and get rid of him. He's a plaything. So he is like an avenue for them to travel around in public and be seen and et cetera. And notice so he's a gigolo. I think kind of, I but not, I mean, I don't think they're necessarily paying him for sex. He's providing them with a very important service. And he makes them feel good about themselves. And sex. And sex. <laughs> so, yes, you don't you. pay for the sex. You do the sex as a tip. Do you guys remember what Charlie Sheen said about prostitutes? Yes. <laughs> I don't pay them for sex. I pay <laughs> them to go away after. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Yeah, somebody asked him once why he took drugs. And he said, first of all, I've never taken drugs. I always paid for them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this section requires us to really dwell very long. Does it? Uh, no, it doesn't, except for that one moment where Relic Nom enters the scene. Yeah, he's down on the street below, kind of making eye contact, unwanted eye contact. <laughs> and and uh, Marilio's like, that fool, he's going to blow everything. He, all he has to do is not look like a killer, and he looks like the bloodiest, stinkiest, dirtiest killer there ever was. Yeah, he implies that he's making it so obvious it's a fool could see <laughs> Morelio did say in there that he did not like messing around with married women. Why? He didn't want to risk a duel with Turban Orr. So there's another reference to dueling. And then there will be another one. They basically make their contract. He will, he will provide her with a service and she will provide him with some tickets. A, a ticket plus one. And this is all part of the plan that Ralik came up with. And this is when Marilio, after, Mar after he's seen Ralic down on the street, Marilio was commenting to himself that this guy is kind of like obtuse and very rectangular and his mind doesn't seem like it could come up with a plan as elaborate as this plan, but this was all Ralic's plan and it's very elaborate and it requires that Mrs. Turban or get them the tickets for some reason. And when... It's all said and done, and she's agreed to get the tickets, and he's agreed to provide her with whatever it is she wanted. 
they part ways. And he says to her something very interesting. Goodbye. He says, lady of chance. <gasps> I did not pick up on that. I don't know that it's not just a cliche, but he does say that he was grateful that the lady of chance allowed them to have this meeting. He knows perfectly well that it was planned. There was no chance involved, right? They sought her out on purpose, but that's what he says to her. So I think it's a cliche. Well, at least there's no coin spinning in the background. There isn't. Well, that fate's going to be something else. A casual stroll through the higher estates district is cut short when Ralik Nam sees a familiar face. You mentioned in the last section that, and I'm sorry, Philip did, that Marilio was looking down at Ralik, trying to wave him on. He's like, this guy looks like an obvious killer. But he was told to be obvious by his clan leader. He said, make it plain what you do for a living, because they're trying to set a trap, as we recall. Yeah, he's bait or something to catch the assassin of assassins or something. So maybe he's not the smartest saw <laughs> in, the, in the woodshed or whatever, but he's doing exactly what he was told to do <laughs> on some level. And he's, he's kind of, he knows that he's obvious. He knows that the guards at the gate that he's passing by are like looking at him like, ooh, this guy's a killer. <laughs> he knows that they know, but they don't really know. So they can't do anything about it. So he, he, he's thinking about the, uh, the Malazans. Well, he did imply that assassins' guilds were kind of outlawed in the Malazan Empire, and if the Malazans took over the city, then they'd be out of work or out of life. It's the same thing with the wizards. Yes. They're Join either, or die. Yes. They're recruited or, if, they, or they disappear. If they're found worthy, yes. they're recruited by the claw. Otherwise, they disappear. So you, you were trying to jump here, Yule. So let's go now because I think oh, it's yeah. in chronological order. We get Ralik's perception of Marilio here. Ralik Nam is wondering whether or not Marilio is able to get the invitation secured. And in doing so, he's kind of reminiscing about the argument they had the day before about how Murillo didn't want to get involved with someone else's wife. The way he usually works is, you know, honing in on widows and stuff like that. Eligible it's women. Eligible women, exactly. You know, hot to trot ladies. <laughs> yeah, not um, married women. Yeah, exactly. Not married women. And at first, Ralik Nam thinks that Murillo is scared of fighting Turban Orc. But he lets us know that uh, Marilio is a skilled fighter. In fact, he calls him an adept. A capital A adept. Exactly. He surmises that it's not because of the fighting that he doesn't want to get involved with a married woman. It's actually a moral reason. And that's just something that you know lends a little bit of uh, character to the character of Marilio. There's some character in that character. He's not just a um, playboy gigolo, necessarily. Do you think it's bad for business? If all those ladies were looking at him and he was going out with someone else's wife, and that isn't the way he normally operates, maybe it's just uh, letting people know that he's open for business. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think there's any question about him being open for business. They were seen in public together and I don't know that that's good for business for him. Like if his job essentially is to be the arm upon which these women are showcased in public and he's showcasing a married woman, I think it could be detrimental to his long-term business. Too many husbands are going to start paying attention to him. His ability to be there it could be truncated pretty quickly. But it, it, Ralik thinks it's a moral thing. And I, I'm not sure that we've seen that yet. We haven't gotten that from anybody but Ralik so far. Well, we have to assume that the argument that they had about the plan was something that actually happened. I don't think there's a, a, uh, a, a dishonest narrator in this situation. Just a random thought here. I wonder if any part of that is also falls in line with the concept of try not to be noticed. And if you're going out with married women you're going to drag a lot more attention, right? And I think, I think that point is valid. And he'd, he'd rather keep a lower profile, as would Krupp, as would Crocus, as would... Ralic. Ralic, yeah. <laughs> Although Ralic is going against his nature by dressing like a ding-dong. Well, they, they're ordering him to. You're right. Let's discuss what it means to be an adept with a capital A. Okay. 
when you capitalize a word that makes it a proper noun, which adds a certain amount of importance to the word, right? Sure. Maybe it's a title. Right. Right. A title. So the other person that was an adept, I believe, who has a capital A was Tattersail. That's, yep. She's an adept. Uh, but she's an adept with a deck of dragons. This is different. He's an adept with dueling swords, apparently. Or at least that's what Rallick thinks. On page 184, if you guys will look, it says, In the aura of the twins, an adept may hear, see, smell, and touch things as insubstantial as the wind. That word adept is also capitalized. And this is referring to, we don't know. I don't know what kind of adept, but it's some kind of adept. So it is a title. I think Philip's correct. It implies something of power. There's another word that we see capitalized in this chapter. I don't remember what page it's on. It doesn't really matter because every time you see the word, it's capitalized, and that is ascendant. So I'm wondering, do you guys think it's possible that this is a hierarchy? I honestly don't know, but it's, it's clear that he has been imbued with certain status if you're called an adept with a capital A. I mean, that word's not given to just anybody. No. Nor is it casually, oh, he's adept at mowing grass. Right. And the word's meaning is actually like skilled at something. Ralic Nam is having some thoughts and some things, and we've noticed this word, and he thinks Marilio is pretty good with the sword and could hold his own against Turban Orr, which is a, it's putting it in our head again. And then he notices somebody familiar across the street and he starts to follow them. His mind elsewhere, Crocus tells Krupp of a coin he found. So Crocus is planning another heist. He's thinking of robbing Turban Orr. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know where he got that notion. I don't understand like why he thinks that that's a good idea, but he, as he's walking up to Turban Orr's estate, <laughs> This carriage goes by with no regard for, for pedestrian traffic, whatever. It's just like barreling down the road and people are diving out of the way. And it's Turbinor in his carriage. Crocus thinks to himself that even the horses don't care about Turbinor's constituents. Yeah, yeah. He thinks that it's, uh, it's pretty telling. When he says that, or when he thinks that it's the duelist's horses. Yeah, there it is again. Yeah. There it is again. So this gets Crocus on a line of reasoning and thinking that kind of changes his mind about why he does what he does. But he's a thief, obviously, we know this. But he starts to feel rueful and a little bit of regret because he realizes that what he has done is a form of a violation, that his theft of the Darl daughter's possessions was very disruptive. It's more damaging than just taking stuff. Yeah, but he doesn't care about the nobility. He hasn't ever. He's got it in his mind that they're kind of not worth caring about, that they don't care about anybody else, so why should he care about them? But he's had a change of heart because he's looked upon this girl and he sees that she's just a young girl. Girl, beautiful young girl and and maybe 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 he thinks she's pretty fancy yeah he feels like he took her privacy he says it's akin to rape and he feels really bad about this and he is going to approach Krupp so that he can get some of those items back and maybe return them to the girl Right, that's his reasoning. Crocus is kind of scoping out Turban Orr's place. Like, he's going to burgle this place if he gets the opportunity. And so he's, he notices this little alleyway, and he's like, I'm going to go check this out. And then, whoo! Relic numb. He doesn't even know somebody's right next to him. He feels a knife at his throat. Oh, who is it? A relic numb. What does what Relic tell him? He's all, what are you doing here? Uh, maybe you might want to keep moving on. Yeah, this isn't a place for you to be. Why? Well, he tells him Orr's place is off limits. He does say it that way. Since Crocus is the coin bearer, do you think Opon had any influence on him even wanting to go to Orr's house? Or is that just coincidence? Well, Ralik Nam has this plan. See, that's what I mean. It's kind of like Opon jumped into Ralik Nam's mind and had him come up with this elaborate plan. 
and Ralik Nob does not want Crocus to mess it up. Doesn't want him to do anything, no matter how insignificant, to screw it up. It's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, I do think that Opan is perfectly well aware of what Crocus is up to. Uh, I don't think there's a question in that. And since Ralik's mind has been accessed by Opan and is being used by them, I suspect that they're also aware of what he's up to. If anything, though, I would say that they wouldn't interfere with their own plan. Well, they're brother and sister. I mean, maybe. There's been no evidence to suggest so far that they're working at odds with each other. I don't think this is an example of them working at odds. Fair enough. I think he was just casually scoping it out. and I, I, That's what I was thinking, too. Like, he's, he's thinking about it. <laughs> he's like, wouldn't it be an interesting place to go? Yeah, he might be may, maybe leaning more towards doing it. It seemed a little out of place going after the Aura state. Like maybe he feels real brazen now that he's done the Daryl state. Maybe he is, you know, maybe placing who he wants to steal from in the future, kind of picking and choosing his people rather than just going for it. And maybe he's just walking through the neighborhood and picking up information like yeah. anybody would that did his job. Maybe he wasn't really seriously considering it. But he strayed long enough for Raleigh to say, hey. Until somebody told him not to, and they'd be like, hey, what are they up to? Okay, so you remember how Crocus was pestering Marilio? Like, what were you and Ralic talking about? Yeah. And they wouldn't let him know. They wouldn't tell him, right? Neither one of them would say a word about it. And now here we are. He's telling him to get away. So in a way, this is Erickson communicating information to Crocus. So we have to assume that Crocus needs this information in order to motivate him in some way for the future. So I, th I think really that's what's going on. Is Ralik here just keeping tabs? No, because he's over at the Simtal estate. What is Ralik doing over here? He's on his way to meet Marilio. Just like last chapter, this is taking place in a really short period of time. Marilio is having dinner with Mrs. Orr to get the tickets. Ralik is on his way to kind of burn some time or something until Marilio and he can meet up later and find out, did you get the tickets? Yes or no? Blah, blah, blah. Right. And in that process, he runs across Crocus. So he's just wasting time right now. Yeah. Or something. So, but he warns him off of the Orr estate. Don't think about it. It's a bad idea. It's really heavily guarded and, and it's off limits, basically. Go yeah. away. Yeah, but uh, Crocus counter-evaluated and said with like, wow, so Ralik has something going on with yep. Orr. And he said, wow, that's a bold contract. Yes. Bold of the person who made the contract, but bolder of Ralik for taking it. We leave Ralik there. Crocus takes the warning to heart and he wanders off, at least for now. And he goes to find Krupp at the Boar's Tears. And I will admit defeat here. There's the casual throwaway about the sign over the tavern entrance being a three-legged ram. But the name of the tavern is the Boar's Tears. You know, that's got to be some joke from his gaming days. I hope so, because I couldn't figure it out. It's, it's Kala. I spent too many hours looking up three-legged rams and three-legged goats i got nothing i can't believe how many videos there are on it but none of it seems pertinent to what's going on here it's the largest public building in worry town i kind of had the impression worry town was kind of like the poor part of town like the slums almost or just where the maybe well there's all the people that are funneling through in through it from pale the refugees and stuff yeah exactly well, Worry Town, yeah, Worry Town, Worry Town is outside the city wall. Is it? Yeah. Oh. Krupp may go there because I know why he's there, but I think he goes there so because the guards don't patrol that area, maybe. <laughs> I think it's easy access to people coming and going. Well, that right? too. Yeah. Yeah. So, people's people's coming and going. Well, aren't okay, so you know why you know why Krupp is there, but Crocus is going to look for Krupp. What is Krupp up to? Why is Krupp there? Well, the reason, yeah, he's going there to find him before he he fences all of Crocus's illicit gains. He wants the Daryl De collection. Yeah, he wants it back so he can do something with it. Yeah, and he knows he knows Krupp is going to sell it. He doesn't know to who, but this is where Krupp goes to sell stuff. Yes, so he headed him off the pass to meet his contact and meet Krupp, make sure he doesn't, doesn't sell it. Right. When he meets Krupp there... Krupp is in the middle of telling some ridiculous story about wraiths in a tomb and killing priests and being really, really adept at magic, right? 
to some guy, some poor refugee who's like, no, 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 you didn't interrupt at all. I was just leaving. Bye-bye. Right before he found Krupp, Crocus put his hand deep in his pocket and he found that coin again. It's like he forgot it was there. And so Krupp's like, hey, what do you got there? And he talks about how he picked it up. He had wondered whether or not, or how he got the coin in the first place, Crocus it was. He was like, maybe I kicked it when I was running across the roof. He says, or maybe it was in my clothing. Maybe it fell off or something was kind of hanging there. He does acknowledge that it's unlike any coin he's ever seen before. And he goes through coins of other countries or city states that he has seen. He said, it's nothing like it. Well, let's describe it. Uh, The first side he held up was the profile of a young man with an amused expression, wearing some kind of floppy hat. Tiny, rune-like lettering ran around the edge. It was a language the thief didn't recognize. And like you said, it was uh, different from the cursive Daru script that he was familiar with. Crocus turns the coin, another head, this one a woman's facing the other way. The etched script here was of a style different from the opposite side, a kind of left slanting hatchwork. The woman looked young with features similar to the man's. Her expression held nothing of amusement, seeming to the thief's eyes cold and unyielding. And then they go into the metal of the coin. It was old, streaked here and there with raw copper and pitted around the faces with rough tin. Crocus shows this to Krupp. What does Krupp do? Well, he's examining it and saying it's pretty worthless looking. Poorest quality. Poorest quality. The person should be hanged. Who made this? In fact, he probably was. Crooked stamping. It's, yeah, it's terrible. Terrible. And then Krupp's like, hey, Crocus, do me a favor and go see if you see this cart outside. And you know, when I read that, you didn't get it, right? You thought that was a legitimate question to ask him, right? He he deceived you as well. Yeah. And Krupp gives him the coin back, says, I, you know, discard it at your leisure. It's essentially worthless. Yeah, but he says, no, it's it's my good luck charm. I'm going to keep it. Okay. Like, literally, he says, good luck charm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a good luck charm. It saved his life. I think he's put that together, right? As Crocus is leaving, he glanced again in his hand. I must have picked up some wax somewhere, he explained, and he rubbed it on his leg and green sheepish, sheepishly. Yeah, exactly. Long story short, his whole purpose for getting here is to talk to Krupp to get the uh, Darl's stuff back. And Krupp admits that he has not fenced it yet and he can have it back. But Krupp is, knows exactly what's going on in Crocus's mind. He's like, oh, a smitten lad, are we? Yeah, teasing him just a little bit. He doesn't admit it, but Krupp knows. Well, it, it, the question is, does Crocus know? <laughs> Ralic and Marilio meet as friends. So Marilio is trying to meet up with Ralic. They have business together, obviously. I don't see any point in really going into the details of how they end up meeting together or really much about where they're meeting. It's kind of superfluous. I think it's suffice to say it's, it's... It's interesting. It's interesting. It's the assassin headquarters. You can't just walk in. It's a little network of storefronts that lead to it. Well, because they specifically say, and this is one thing I'm going to say, uh, Crute says to Marilio that tell Ralic when you see him that the guild isn't happy about him giving away our secrets. Yes, and to be clear, can you say his name out loud again? Uh, Krut. Not Krupp. Krut of, the, of Talient. In actual fact, he's a gatekeeper yes. for the Assassin's Guild, and Ralic has told Marilio one of their secrets and blah, blah, blah. But they get together yeah. at this abandoned tower that is purportedly haunted. And Ralic's not there when Marilio gets there, and he's going towards this tower, which has just got a, There's no door. There's just an archway leading into the tower, and the grounds are kind of unkempt and... The cobbles are all torn up from scrub oak trees and et cetera. And he's walking up to the tower entrance when Ralic appears. Yeah, Ralic's like, don't go there. He's like, I thought you just told people that to keep them away. And he's like, go, he's like, go, go find out for yourself. It's real. But what's yeah. uh, Marilio, Marilio, what's his uh, first response when he's uh, surprised by Ralic? <laughs> yeah, he pulls out his uh, rapier. And his mangouche. I mean, it's... Mm-hmm. S- superb reflexes and and Ralic is like yeah you're not getting too fat looks like an adept to me adept yeah he, he he mocks him a little bit about being a pudgy around the midsection 
Yeah, he turned on Ralic in a, at a moment's notice. His reflexes are still good, which is a good thing, I think, because if Erickson's trying to tell us anything, it's that this poor guy's going to get into a fight later. <laughs> Nevertheless, they have a meeting, and I really enjoyed this meeting because it starts off, they're kind of like is a little bit of banter, but as the conversation goes on, they both let their guard down and they're just the friends that they were when they grew up. There's no sarcasm involved. Like Ralic is being Ralic, Marilio is being Marilio. They're talking to each other like friends. And it's really kind of nice to see, you know, because they've they've got these personas that they have to carry around. Ralic is an assassin. He's a professional. He has to behave and act and talk in a certain way. Marilio, he's a dandy. He's also a professional. And when they're interacting, it's normally kind of, they don't let their guard down all the time. And here they do. They talk about Crocus and how the young thief is in love. And they're like, you know, a, a good word here with his uncle. And maybe we could save this poor kid's life, you know, because he's heading down the wrong road, the road that they took. That is a good point. I think it was really kind of cool that they kind of stepped up and, and considered helping out their buddy, maybe get with this girl moving up in life. He's young version of them. I think that's what they're seeing, maybe. They're, yeah, exactly. They're seeing the them, and this is their chance to change their lives, in a sense, through him, Crocus. If he is different, then we, in a sense, have changed also. They do say save his life. Yeah, it's definitely saving his life. He's definitely on a path that is extremely dangerous to his longevity. And it wouldn't be a bad thing, you know, to get an education, to become a, an actual upstanding citizen. Even though those are the people that we're really watching be like the demise of the city. Well, I mean, they're not all bad people. <laughs> they're not all bad. <laughs> well, Crocus does come from a good family. He just became a rogue, I guess, for fun. Well, his parents weren't around. They died, right? And he yeah. was being raised by Mamet, who is very distracted with what he's doing. He's not a parent. He's you know, he's, nerd. he's an uncle who ended up with a kid strapped to his leg. Right. Well, so I think, I think your point is cool, and I didn't really pick up on it at all. But I think they're looking out for him, and they want the best for him, which I think is awesome. But more importantly, you know, even though Ralik is a murderer, you know. He is an assassin. He is a professional murderer. Fair enough. But he does have goodness in him. Everybody does, right? And then it's not like he's a cold-hearted murderer. Inside his circle, you're inside his circle, and he looks out for you. And you know what? This is exactly why I like these kinds. Of, I mean, I like the characters that are complicated. I like thinking about these people. And, like, we've seen the bridge burners. They're harboring sorry, right? But, like, Quick Ben is responsible for so many deaths. His buddy Kalam is as cold-blooded a killer as sorry is. But we like the guy, you know? I think it really says something about Erickson's talent, to be honest, that we can care about these characters even though they are, you know, part of them is a horrible person. Part of me is a horrible person. I think it's realistic and it's, it's a lot easier to identify with than somebody who's just purely good or purely bad because I'm not, you know, so how, how am I supposed to relate to that nonsense? So there is like one reason why they are getting here that we didn't discuss. Well, what is that? And that's the fact that Marilio actually was able to secure the tickets. Yeah, yeah. this whole thing was just like, did you get him? Yeah, I got him. <laughs> yeah, I got him. And then, yeah, and then it's just a character piece, you know. It's these guys, like you said, in a very warm-hearted way, reminiscing about themselves and their friends. You know, kind of reasserting, because this is like the end of this book. Yes, I know what you mean. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this part. The, there are seven, eight books in this novel, seven or eight, and this is book two. And it's the end of this book. So it's reminding us. It's, it's a good refresher on who our friends are, what their motivations and motives are yep. going into, you know, yep. farther into the book. That's a good observation. Thank you. Let's talk real quick about what we learned in this chapter because there's a couple other things, I think. Ralic and Marilio are comparing notes here. And they are like, is Krupp aware? And they're like, nope, Krupp's not aware. Whatever they're working on, they're keeping that secret from Krupp as well as from Crocus. And what they are planning is bloody. People are going to die. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How do they refer to Krupp here? He's a slippery one is Krupp. That's also something worth remembering for the future. Disturbed by an insistent agent, High Alchemist Baruch 
learns of a coin. The night has ended, essentially. Because now it's morning. Yeah, Baruch is just getting up. He's working on his map, right? He's working on his map, showing all the spots where Malazan has taken over. Yeah. And the only spots that aren't are basically Darujistan and a couple of bordering areas, like just south of them, I think. He's using like diluted red wash to color over the map, uh, implying that the, there's a red spread of Malazan well, occupation. Rem- remember the color of their banner or flag or whatnot is burgundy and gray. There are three spots that are not colored red. One of them is uh, Caladan Brood's forces in the north, just south of Black Dog Forest, and then flanked on either side are the Crimson Guard. So they're surrounded. But apparently Caladan Brood is giving the Malazans hell, (laughs) even though he's surrounded. So that's something to think about. So what's going on right now is as he's doing that, he also is taking note of all the construction that's going on outside of his office. It's really early in the morning. Yeah, he like sticks his head outside and he's like listening to them talking and really just kind of uh, arguing with each other about what's supposed to be torn up and all this other stuff. (laughs) And he wonders who's in charge of road construction. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, going to have to have a talk with those guys. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, he goes back to doing his map updating. There's a loud crack outside from the road construction, and his arm jerks, and he knocks over his ink pot. Yes. To me, it's a little about an imagery and maybe even foreshadowing just of the spreading ink of the Malazan Empire as it takes over the map. Yeah, totally. That's what I was thinking, too. But, I mean, he actually says it. He's so artful in the way that he uh, allows us to figure out what's going on. But he says he's a little more little shaken by what could easily be taken as an omen. Well, yeah. And I don't know if that's a line that Erickson needed to write, is all I'm saying. That's true. However, it's something that Baruch is thinking. Yeah, and Baruch's the kind of guy that would think about that kind of thing. I don't think that it's out of character for him to think something like that. I mean, he deals in this kind of stuff on the regular. So Erickson including it, I think, was a smart move, to be honest. Right. I mean, how else are you supposed to get character details if the author doesn't tell us? Like, we don't need to know that it could be an omen. We can interpret it that way. But knowing that Baruch interprets it that way is telling about Baruch's character. Did you guys find it amusing that Rold introduced Krupp as one of Baruch's agents? Yeah, well, you know, uh, Baruch's like, hey, why don't you tell them to wait for a second? I'm doing something. And then Krupp, like, barges his way through. So why is Krupp here? He's got information, obviously. But, like, what's the, what is he doing? What's he telling this guy? Well, the first thing he says is, oh, yeah, have you partaken of the morn's fresh air? Which causes Baruch to have a conversation with him about the construction going on outside. Hint, hint. Right. He says, Baruch, dear friend of Krupp. And in Krupp's mind, they're equals, right? They're friends. They're friends. I'll go that far. Something to that effect. They're on a familiar level. Whereas Baruch is more like, oh, you know, you're just kind of one of my informants. Well, what is he, what is Krupp there to deliver? Krupp is conveying to to Baruch Mm -hmm. that throats are being slit, profits have plummeted. Baruch said the assassin war, it isn't internal. And Krupp says, no. And Baruch says, has this new force been identified then? And he said, no. So the the only point I want to make there is that they know it's not an assassin war. There's there's some other force at play that nobody knows about. And that's the only piece of information that's different from last chapter, right? Yes. But even in last chapter, we knew it wasn't internal. No, we knew. No, 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 no. Ocelot knew. Ocelot told Ralik, it's not internal. What do you think? We're stupid? Yeah, we've already figured this stuff out. So why is he double, doubling down on this information? Why didn't he wait and just have us find out right now? It would have made more sense. This is a criticism of last chapter that we couldn't talk about in last chapter because Ocelot had already figured all of this stuff out and relayed it to Ralik Nam, and that had happened within the first like five hours of there being deaths, right? They already knew all this information. So we really didn't have any business learning that stuff until now. It would have been a better reveal in my opinion, or to happen right now. Fine, but I think the 
the whole purpose of this is because Krupp is reporting what he knows. And this is really important because the Assassin's Guild is an important force within the machinations of of Drew, the city. Yeah, Drew's down. And there's another force invading that nobody knows anything about. And that's something that Brute needs to know. Um, they don't think it's the claw though, right? They've kind of dismissed it being the claw because it's counterproductive to what the Empress normally does. This is another thing that's repeated. Normally, the Empress's claw recruit from the Assassin's Guilds that they take over. They don't wipe them out. And this is somebody wiping them out. Right. So that's another thing that we've had twice now. Almost like it's a repetition for some reason. Like we didn't get it the first time. I don't know. But it's not an Assassin's Guild. I mean, it's not an Assassin's War. Right. That's just how they're referring to it because they don't really know what's going on yet. So we know, though, actually who is actually going out and killing these assassins. It's not an assassin's war at all within it's, these guilds. It's an assassin's slaughter. It's Animander Rake's minions doing it? Is that what it is? That's what it seems like, yeah. So that's up, that there's an assassin's war going on. But this is not enough information to excite Baruch. Baruch is like, okay, you can go now. Yeah, he does. He tells him to go. <laughs> and poor Krupp. Krupp is like, but it's so hot. I just want some of your alcohol. Yeah, he's totally spying this this wine on a, like a windowsill or something. There's a decanter on the yeah. on the hearth, I think. Yeah, that's what it is. And yeah, he wants it. Yeah, that's not good enough information to get some alcohol out of Baruch. No, Krupp uh, produces that coin, basically. It's the impression of the coin, Opon's coin, that Crocus had. So he pressed it into soft wax on both sides of this disc to get reverse impressions. And that is why Crocus's hands felt waxy. Yes, but, but Krupp was so sly about it. He's like, hey, go over to the window and see if you see a red wagon. He was so sly about it that we didn't catch it right For away. Three readings of this thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know the problem is especially with this book you know it can get very wordy and he can feel like he's droning on and as you're reading it you don't realize that important things are actually being given to you it's not even sometimes it's all the time we talked about it in the very first episode this book requires close attention this is not a book you can just read casually like there's too much heavy information being delivered to you all the time like a fire hose so he sets this he calls it a semblance he refers to it that way two or three times it's just an impression of the coin in wax and he set it on the windowsill. And then Baruch is like, oh, you may have some wine now. And so Krupp wanders off to go get a little bit of booze. And Baruch starts. He doesn't even touch it, does he? No, he picks it up with magic. Yeah, he like levitates it or he mage opens, hands it or He something. opens his warren to investigate this semblance. Mm -hmm. But I think it's interesting that he didn't even touch it. There's something that I didn't figure out until just now, and I, I'm just going to throw this out there, and you guys let me know if you agree or disagree. I think the coin is a known artifact, famous. So like uh, these decks that are running around, these deck of dragons, it's kind of like that. Yeah, except worse. Okay, so let's talk about D&D &D really quick. So you know how the deck of many things, it's only got one owner at a time, and when they're done with it, it just goes away? And then it appears with somebody else later on, or it can be found later on, but it doesn't stay with people very long. No, it's a major artifact. I think this thing is too. And I think this thing moves around in the same manner. I want you to read very carefully what Krupp says about the coin. An item, he said softly, his eyes on the disc, that passes without provenance, pursued by many who thirst for its cold kiss, on which life and all that lay within life is often gambled. Alone a beggar's crown, in great numbers, a king's folly. Weighted with ruin, yet blood washes from it beneath the lightest rain. And to the next, no hint of its cost. It is as it is, says Krupp, worthless, but for those who insist otherwise. Note that he began that paragraph referring to it as an item that passes without provenance. That is what started me down this train of thought that it's a famous artifact. And also note, Krupp says that it's worthless, but for those who insist otherwise, and Crocus insists otherwise. 
that it is a luck charm. Gotcha. What do you guys think? I've thrown out my conjecture. I, I speculate that it is a major artifact. It is definitely something that passes from person to person, or at least it feels that way. It's sought after by people, which means it's famous. Krupp recognized it instantly, but did he recognize it instantly because he knew exactly what the coin was, or did he recognize it because he had the foreshadowing to know that, you know, it's with the youth? I doubt he's ever seen it before. I doubt he's ever been given a very good description of it before. No, but... But he was prepared to make a, a cast. I don't know if he was prepared. He just carries a wax disc in his pocket probably, all the time. Probably. Yeah, you're probably for keys and stuff. <laughs> he is a thief, after all. Well, I mean, he had the dream up front. He knew the coin was in play. Yeah. yeah. He didn't know who had it, I don't think. But then when, when Crocus delivered it to him, he very quickly took a cast... Well, it's an impression. He made an impression. So what does this uh, impression do? What does Baruch do with it? Well, as Philip mentioned, he uses his warren to inspect it. He wants to see both faces. So he, he looks at the face, and then he flips it around, and then it starts spinning of its own accord and disintegrates, essentially. It's like hot, melted wax blowing off in all directions. Yeah, it's splattered everywhere. And Krupp warns him, well, no, he, he informs him quite after the fact that, oh, you, don't, you, you shouldn't bother with a Warren. No Warren can withstand the breath of the twins. So even the semblance, this, this is the other thing. It's like, it's just an impression of the coin, and it is incredibly powerful. Just the image alone was powerful enough to collapse a master wizard's warren. Yes. I think Baruch knew it was inherently dangerous. Just the impression. That's why he didn't touch it. I, I, would, go, I would go that far. Do you think Baruch is aware of it as an artifact? I, I think yes. Okay. So what, what's the fallout here? Well, the fallout is that Baruch wants to know who owns this coin. The owner is Opon. It's someone, well, okay, yeah, who's in possession of it, I guess I should say. And Krupp at first is like, oh, it's someone that's known to all your agents, Marilio, Ralic, and Cole. That's a revelation. So when this wax impression, like, melted and stuff, Baruch was just, like, overwhelmed with, like, pain. Do you remember that? Yeah, collapsed his warrant and he got an instant headache. I just, weird thing. Krupp talks about being a wizard, but we've never seen him cast any magic, have we? Nope. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. And he didn't get a headache. Yes, exactly. So the headache thing that you're referring to, I'm assuming that you're bringing it up because people who are sensitive to magic yes. react differently to magic. But not everybody gets a headache. That's probably true, but... Remember, uh, Callot, he got headaches that made him cry. And I think Tattersail feels pressure and pain... But like Tashrin, nothing. Wasn't there even that one guard though when Sari was passing through? Yeah, and he right. was all yep. messed up. I'm wondering if they didn't do that to him on purpose though. I'm wondering if that wasn't an effect that they were trying to take his mind off of. That her. makes sense. That like makes cause sense. him pain so he wouldn't think about that. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. He was passing through anybody at that time. You know, uh, we need anybody we can get. Yeah, Here, I'm in pain. Go ahead. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yule is referring to the recruiter who brought Sari, the Fisher girl, into the army, which was like step one in chapter two or chapter one or something. Died by pigeons or something like that. <laughs> he didn't die by pigeons. It was a different guy. Oh, right. So a pawn is in the game, and it is now obvious to Baruch. It's obvious to Krupp. Baruch wants to know who's got the coin, and... He's like, you've got to gather all of my agents that have worked for me all this time. We need every resource we have. Your job now is to protect the coin bearer. And there's something else they want to know. They want to know if the lady has them or the Lord. Because if the Lord has them, that's bad news. It seems, yeah, we've gotten that several times now, that the Lord's attention is not really what you want, but the ladies is a little bit more desirable. Well, they did say that on 184. He's like, a taste of Lady Yuck. <laughs> yuck? Lady Yuck. <laughs> I What's... dated her once. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Well, Krupp mentions it. He said, a taste of Lady Luck or the bitter warning of the Lord's laughter. Let's talk about the lady really quick. They said earlier in this chapter that the lady's all business. If you look at the description of the coin when Crocus is looking at it, she looks severe. 
and businesslike. Do you remember when Perrin was healed? How he was healed without any regard for his well being, for his emotional or mental well being? It was just business like, heal the body, get him back on his feet. That was the lady. So now they need to know if it's the lady or the Lord that has Crocus. Do you think it's significant that the first face that Crocus looked at was the Lord's? I don't know. But let's look at what we do know, the machinations that Opon has put into play. That seems like more of a game, doesn't it? Go on. Well, I think what you're implying is that the jester has it, the Lord. I'm suggesting it is a possibility, certainly, because that was the first face that he looked upon. Baruch mentions that they're going to have to be really careful now because a pawn has a way of ruining very, very carefully laid plans. And then Baruch puts his hands on his windowsill and he looks out into the night and he says, or the early morning, I suppose, and he says, I know you're here somewhere, Empress. I'll find your agents. I'll find them someday. And then he notices his hands are covered in that red wash. And he says, with or without Opon's damned luck. And this is in the throes of, like like you guys were saying, a super crazy migraine headache. Yep. He's got his eyes closed, and he can, he, he's really in a debilitating state right now. Yeah. Okay, so the coin bearer's out in the open. What, I don't know. Like, how do you feel at the end of this chapter? Let's be real blunt. The chapter's over, and now it's time for freeform discussion and a couple of pointed discussions. The, the thing is, is that we know in this book two of Gardens of the Moon. Which is now over also. Which is now over. This Darujistan chapter. We know the people that are aligned that are for the Malazan occupation. And the people that are against it. We have uh, Animander Rake dealing with Baruch. Yep. We have someone going around that looks like Animander Rake's people killing assassins in the city. And it's really hard not to like Animander Rake. And meanwhile, this is all with the idea that the council members are going to basically say, Hey, Malazan, come on in. Take over. Just don't hurt me. <laughs> Do we need to talk about the duel? No. There is no duel. We're fairly, we've gotten lots of evidence that there's a duel coming. It's straight foreshadowing. There's nothing special. We've gotten a lot of evidence for it. It's there. Yeah, but it's like a long ways away. Doesn't matter when it is. The fact of the matter is, like, we're being given. You're the one that doesn't like talking about the future. He is communicating information to us. What I do not like is when people bring stuff from future chapters and talk about it in the present chapter we don't know that stuff yet we know there's going to be a duel it's obvious no i well i i don't think we know the number of times that he's mentioned dueling swords you've talked about foreshadowing why do you refuse this one i'm not refusing you are denying i'm not denying okay but this isn't a text paper it implies that they're both skilled swordsmen maybe nothing more than that you don't bring a gun into a story unless you're going to use it maybe they'll fight together at the end unlikely close us out we're not done oh we aren't are you done what else are we going to talk about i want to talk about krupp what about Krupp? Oh, yeah, we want to talk about Krupp. In the previous chapter, Crocus said that he has never seen Krupp drop his cherubic mask. Yeah. But he is aware that it's a mask. In this chapter, Marilio says that all that holds Krupp together is his fear of being discovered. And then he says he's a slippery one as Krupp, and Ralik agrees, yeah, he's a slippery one. So they're aware that he's not what he seems as well. And then in the very end, when Baruch and he are having a conversation, Krupp is kind of being disingenuous about how dumb he is. He says, well, maybe I'm just being fooled. And Baruch is like, a fool, this man? I don't think so. So even Baruch knows that it's an act. He got into his mind. He got just a flavor. When Krupp was explaining the artifact of the coin to Baruch and that it was in play, he kind of fell into the description like it was an enchantment. And speaking of Krupp not showing any magic yet, that might have been it. Baruch almost went into a trance. If you look at that reading pretty carefully, he was like getting mesmerized by what Krupp was saying. He said he was getting a glimpse into this like library of like polished leather bindings. Yes. And, and he had only just gotten a glimpse 
And then he kind of had to force himself out because he was like, he was losing it. He was leaving his consciousness. Is that something that Baruch can do on his own? I think that's possible. Right? Yeah, that's possible. I, I actually, I think it's more on Baruch's end. But it's like touching a powerful mind, it draws you in. But I, that's fine. I, I, th- I think that was on Brooks, and he was reading him somehow. Because you know how he can send like mental signals to everybody and his guards and his servant? So he definitely has some ability to communicate mentally. He says, Brook was holding his breath. His lungs burned, yet it was an effort to release them. Krupp's words had drawn him into something, which implies it's Krupp, not him. A place hinting of vast stores of knowledge and a sure, unfailing, precise hand that had gathered it, marked it on a parchment. A library, shelves of black wood and sharp relief, tomes bound in shiny leather, yellowed scrolls, a pitted, stained desk. Baruch felt he had but stolen a single glance into this chamber. Krupp's mind. Okay. Everybody that knows Krupp is aware that what he, the face that he shows is not the real guy. Okay. And he's slippery. I mean, I think it's fair. Like at this point in the chapter, I think it's fair to to make certain leaps of logic and jumps. Like we're getting a lot of hints. I think Krupp knows the knows one of the altruisms of life on this world, which is try not to be noticed. So he's got a modified persona. He keeps a low profile. People don't take him seriously because he seems kind of crazy. Which is calculated. Yes. All right, I got nothing else for this chapter, you guys. That was a pretty good one, I think. That ends book two. Next episode begins the third book in the Malazan Book of the Fallen's first book, Gardens of the Moon, and it will be called The Mission. And I assume we're going back to the Bridge Burners? Yeah. Good, because we haven't mm-hmm. seen them in a whole three chapters. I know. Oh, we sure haven't. Well, well, there are three more chapters before the next book. Wait, what? We've just ended book three, right? No, we, yeah. we just ended book two. Yeah, I know. Oh, yeah. So we just ended book two, which was three chapters. We're going to book three, which is three chapters. And then there's, well, book four after that. And then five and then six. What's your point? Well, I don't remember. I was just giving some, you know, wonderful advice to say we got three more chapters in book three. Now we can close it out. Thanks for joining us. If you like what you're doing, let us know, tell your friends, and etc. We'll be back for chapter 8 as quick as can be. And if you notice something that we didn't, please let us know. It's not fun being ignorant. Let me tell you. Take care and keep reading.